Okay, Sujad. Okay, we're live, right? Sorry, yeah. let me just um, uh, quickly do this so that it will be easier to get going. Can't find it. Uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to set up the thing. Okay, yeah, there it is. Right. Okay, cool. Right. Um, so, shall I start? Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Um, so, welcome to the first of uh, these um, Exeter um, Habib uh, seminars on Islam after colonialism, which will be a, a series we'll run throughout this academic year. It's very much a collaboration between the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, where I teach, Sajjad Wizvi, um, in Exeter, and uh, Habib University, particularly through um, Professor Norman Nakwi. Um, and uh, we'll be running um, a bunch of these throughout the academic year, roughly every fortnight. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is the number of reasons. One, of course, is that the particular context we find ourselves, as everyone's noticed, um, you know, creates restrictions in our travel and way in which we share ideas, but also opens up opportunities for us to share ideas globally and connect globally. Um, and within that context, uh, this is something that a uh, topic we've been thinking about, Norma and myself, for a while. And we thought that really um, both the, these terms, Islam and colonialism, are probably amongst the most contested notions of our world. Uh, you know, what do we mean by Islam? How has it transformed? How it, does it refer? What sense does it make? Um, and in particular, how that may have changed in the last um, couple of hundred years or so. And the same thing is true of colonialism. Uh, not least because we have, um, thankfully, a very serious decolonization um, process uh, happening, decolonization of, of knowledge, of curricula, of institutions and the way in which we look at the world going on. And part of that requires us then to make sense of what we mean by colonialism and what sort of impact that has. And, and perhaps even asking the question whether the phrase that we've put forward, Islam after colonialism, whether it's kind of jumping the gun a bit. Have we even got to that point where we can consider Islam after colonialism? So, uh, so what we're trying to do is, is try and grapple with some of these theoretical issues in the study of religion, in sociology and anthropology, in critical theory, how we deal with these notions. And with that uh, in mind, we've uh, then invited a number of colleagues and friends from around the world to give uh, papers that speak uh, to this theme. Uh, and then uh, we will open it up with a discussion. In the first instance, uh, Norma and I will begin the discussion. And then, of course, we'll open it up for others. Um, for those of you who are watching this on Facebook, you will have the opportunity then to ask uh, questions of our guests um, as well. Um, so without uh, further ado, what I think I will do is I'll pass over to Norman, who will introduce our first guest today, and then we will uh, begin. So Norman, over to you. Thank you, uh, Adab, everyone. Sorry for the slight delay in beginning. Uh, we uh, were held up uh, thanks to a technical problem. Uh, but welcome to this webinar series. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Sajjad for initiating this webinar series um, and uh, 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 including me as a partner uh, in this initiative. Uh, this is really one of the most crucial questions uh, of our time. Everyone everywhere should be thinking about what uh, are the transformations that uh, their inheritance, their uh, traditions, have undergone and far it's uh, something that's uh, really really needed because it's uh, taking on monstrous forms uh, our inheritances are being distorted and uh, monstrously transformed really uh, at this point 
uh, across the planet. And really, we need to think seriously about uh, what all was involved in such a dramatic transformation uh, to enable such a dramatic transformation. Um, so I thank Sajjad for uh, bringing this initiative and it's a real pleasure to begin this series uh, with really one of our most uh, innovative, uh, both conceptually and bringing a fresh perspective to uh, really important questions uh, that confront both the region as well as uh, our wider world, a real uh, thinker of modernity really uh, as, uh, as a historian which is of course uh, quite uh, unusual to combine. He's one of the uh, really rare conceptual, rigorous conceptual historians uh, that we have uh, in working in our region. Uh, Professor Faisal Devji from St. Anthony's College at uh, Oxford University, who is the author of several books. Uh, I'll just uh, mention uh, a few. I won't mention the ones that are edited uh, Landscapes of the Jihad, which, uh, with which he began his uh, writing career. Uh, then The Terrorist in Search of Humanity, uh, followed by The Impossible Indian about Gandhi, uh, and uh, really one of the books that he's really known for uh, here in Pakistan, of course, uh, Muslim Zion. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Professor Faisal Devji uh, to talk about his proposed topic, the Khilafat movement. Thank you very much, uh, Norman and Sajad, for inviting me. It really is a pleasure um, um, to have been, of course, to exit a, a number of times. I've not yet had the opportunity to um, uh, visit Habib, but it really is a pleasure to speak virtually to um, your students uh, and other um, audience members in Pakistan and the, and the UK. Uh, so what I want to do is uh, go through, um, obviously I'm not going to give a, a complete a historical description of the Khilafat movement. And I, I take it that most of you uh, have some uh, cognizance of it, you know, something about it. But let me begin with the theme of uh, this set of talks. Um, that Sajjad and Noman uh, are inaugurating today, which is to say Islam after colonialism. Um, now, already in the 1950s, uh, scholars such as W.C. Smith uh, had demonstrated how the term Islam itself is in some ways, in the way we use it today, a colonial inheritance. Uh, that it has become, and indeed became from the 19th century, a proper name. It has lost its character as a verbal noun or as a kind of uh, uh, a, a term that denoted an activity of some kind, whether it is making peace with God or, or anything else. It became indeed a proper name, a noun, uh, very simply, and therefore an identity. Um, recent scholarship, such as that a recent book on the idea of the Muslim world by Jamil Aydin, uh, follows up this thought. Uh, and what I want to do today then is to uh, say something about how pan-Islamism, another, if you will, European category, um, participates both in the making of this proper name called Islam, while also revealing some of its contradictions and maybe uh, its possible futures as well. Now, Khilafat, you know, um, was a movement that began in the aftermath of the First World War, a war in which the Ottoman Empire was defeated along uh, with Germany uh, and the uh, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Habsburg Empire. Uh, and when it was defeated, there was, of course, an immediate move by the victorious powers, Britain and France primarily, to divide up large parts of the Ottoman Empire uh, and Indian Muslims uh, were sufficiently outraged by these moves to mobilize uh, in support of the Arab domains uh, where the Ottomans had ruled uh, until recently. Uh, now, this unprecedented mobilization, unprecedented because it was the largest uh, mobilization of Muslims uh, in, in modern Indian history, uh, has been seen as being both imperialist uh, 
because it supported, of course, the Ottoman Empire, which is an empire like other European empires, uh, but also as anti-imperialist because, of course, it was said to be against the imperial designs of Britain and France in particular. It is seen as being both nationalist uh, because the Khilafat movement very quickly came under the influence and uh, putative leadership of the Indian National Congress. And indeed, Mahatma Gandhi was made its official leader, but also as anti-nationalist uh, in some quarters because it was understood as taking on a set of concerns which had nothing to do with India itself uh, that, that were internationalist. Uh, it is seen finally as both politicizing religion, and this was uh, what the people who ended up being called Hindu nationalists often accused the Khilafat movement of first doing, of politicizing Islam in a new way, but also as the Muslim League eventually argued of depoliticizing religion. So some like Jinnah would argue that what happened uh, with the Khilafat movement was that Muslims were forced into the category of a purely religious group uh, and therefore uh, not allowed to express themselves in properly political terms. Now, what I want to uh, suggest here is that these um, contradictory ways of thinking about uh, the Khilafat movement, uh, we can of course go into them later. What I want to suggest, however, is that it is not an exceptional movement. Um, it is not exceptional because Khilafat is only one of three such movements which occur around the same time and all of which have, if you will, a religious dimension to them. Uh, and you will know what the other ones are, uh, but we haven't thought about these together. So the first that I want to mention is the movement uh, into also internationalist in support of the rights of the Indian, what to be, today you would call diaspora. Right? So Indian laborers and merchants and soldiers uh, who had spread throughout the British Empire and in some places ended up constituting a majority of the population of the place. So Guyana is one such place and Fiji is another. But in Southern and Eastern Africa, in Central Africa and in Trinidad and Tobago, you know, there are many such places, including on the West Coast of North America, you have extensive Indian communities um, and in the early 20th century, they began agitating for more equal treatment. Uh, and Gandhi was, of course, one of the figures who placed himself at the head of this movement. So Gandhi rose to importance outside India, as we know, he was in South Africa, but his movement in South Africa was not simply about South Africa. It was about the Indian labor and trading and military diaspora which was spread across the empire and sometimes even outside the British Empire. Uh, so this was one internationalist movement um, that uh, dovetailed with eventually the Khilafat movement. The other being the Ghadar movement, uh, which was, a, whereas Gandhi's of course was non-violent ostensibly, the Ghadar movement was deliberately and explicitly violent, which was meant to overthrow uh, by force of arms uh, the British Empire. Um, and the Ghadar movement also drew upon this diaspora that Gandhi was interested in it. And we know that it entailed uh, various kinds of um, uh, plots and conspiracies and people traveling between Japan on the one hand and California on the other, right? So, and through Europe. Uh, so when Khilafat emerges in 1919, it emerges to join two prior movements, uh, which are also contemporary with it, and indeed, all these movements share personnel. So someone like Malvi Barkatullah or even Obedullah Sindhi, who became part of the Khilafat, Khilafat movement, had already been in some ways connected to Ghadar, right? And others connected to the, to the Gandhian movement, um, which was about indentured labor and diaspora uh, throughout the empire. So that's the first thing I wanted to say, that even the Khilafat has always been seen as exceptional and as uh, ostentatiously Islamic. It was in fact uh, one of three such movements and the other two also had quite significant religious dimensions to them. We know with Ghadar, you are both Sikh and Hindu 
theorizations of Qadr uh, and uh, if you will, theological um, justifications of it. Uh, and Gandhi of course was not averse to using religious language in his own um, activism for the Indian diaspora. Um, now these movements are interesting and crucial because they address all three of them, the British empire's global reach. Uh, and what's interesting about this is that the British empire was more or less unique um, because it had no geopolitical integrity. Uh, it was very large, it was scattered across the surface of the earth um, and it lacked a kind of, uh, if you will, a geopolitical body. It could not be imagined uh, in, in the way that the Ottoman Empire could be imagined, which is a contiguous empire, more or less. Right? Um, and that was why it tended to be justified uh, in humanitarian terms. So this is an argument made by a great enemy of the British Empire, uh, uh, but who was also, as it were, a great enemy of many others, the Nazi, eventually Nazi theorist, uh, the jurist Carl Schmitt. He argues that when, when discussing the, what he calls the nomos of the earth, the way in which uh, the globe becomes a site for political imagination once that becomes possible uh, through technology um, uh, and military reach, uh, that when this, when this happens, uh, the British empire uh, assumes a really quite uh, interesting role uh, because it becomes impossible to think of it uh, in traditional imperial terms, uh, uh, ge geographically. And what this results in then is the British Empire justify justifying itself in humanitarian terms. Um, uh, and what Schmidt tells us is that the first and perhaps most important way in which this justification works is with uh, the abolition of slavery. Right? So the abolition of slavery you have Britain um, asserting uh, that its military rule, a uh, role uh, across the world's seas uh, uh, is dedicated uh, to the humanitarian task of ensuring uh, emancipation. Uh, so we know that the Royal Navy is uh, uh, willing to uh, stop and, and check uh, uh, ships um, while breaking international law and doing so in order to make sure that they were not carrying slave cargo and all the rest, right? So for Schmidt, the abolition of slavery serves as one of the earliest uh, and most important examples of the British empire's self-justification in humanitarian terms. And I mentioned this because I want to look in what follows at how the Khilafatists end up taking this idea of humanitarianism and transforming it in various ways. Um, now, another way in which the British Empire justified itself in specifically Muslim terms uh, was uh, by offering itself and its rule uh, as a kind of unilateral gift that created an obligation among its subjects. Right? So the interesting thing about British imperialism is even though it depended in many places upon treaties and contracts with what in India were known as native princes or native states, principalities. Uh, in, in the whole, it was justified by rejecting the idea of contract and compact and treaty. It was justified in humanitarian terms as a unilateral gift. There could be no contract with its subjects uh, because there was no equality between the empire and its subjects. The subjects might indeed be unable to even appreciate the gift that had been given to them, the gift of free trade, the gift of law and order, the gift of um, uh, you know, just rule uh, and the gift of railways, all the, all the cliches that we I'm sure know about. Um, and one of the ways in which this gift was offered in religious terms uh, had to do with, um, and this comes back to the category of humanity, with uh, demography, all right? Uh, because humanity and humanitarianism is conceptualized uh, in this period in demographic terms. Uh, so the British Empire, we knew, we know, 
tended to describe itself on occasion and certainly to its Muslim subjects as the greatest Mohammedan power in the world. Uh, and when it did so, of course, it, it was, it was self-consciously contrasting itself to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and that contrast was uh, made possible by the fact that the British uh, 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 privileged demography over anything else uh, in their claim, right? So precisely because Britain contained more Muslims in her empire uh, than the Ottomans did in theirs, it was Britain that became the greatest Mohammedan power and that, uh, uh, that power uh, was justified uh, uh, or was made legitimate rather because it offered its Muslim subjects religious freedom. Uh, its, its basis was in religious freedom uh, and the Ottoman Empire of course was seen as not offering religious freedom to its non-Muslim and indeed in some cases even to its Muslim um, subjects. So when the Khilafat movement begins, what its principal actors are dealing with uh, is on the one hand, this humanitarian ideology, the idea of the empire as a gift uh, uh, and the humanitarianism understood in demographic terms. Um, and they're dealing with the universality of the empire phrased in humanitarian terms precisely because it has no geopolitical integrity, right? It has uh, no way of thinking of itself um, geographically, which is an interesting problem that we can go into perhaps later. So when Gandhi, um, uh, even before the Khilafat movement begins, uh, but once the war begins in 1914, uh, when Gandhi starts dealing with the British Empire with the beginning of the war in a new way, he does so by taking this idea of the gift and as it were returning it to the empire. It's by trying to create a reverse obligation. Uh, so he takes the empire's logic and, and sort of turns it on its head. And he does this in various ways. For instance, in 1914, he comes from South Africa to London and then we know that he moves from London back to India. While he's in London, he organizes or tries to organize an ambulance corps for service uh, on the Western Front, an ambulance corps made up of Indian students and others who were in England. Uh, and we know, of course, he had organized ambulance corps on two previous occasions in South Africa uh, during the Boer War and the Bambata Rebellion, otherwise known as the Zulu War. Um, and he does so unilaterally, just like the British profess their humanitarian duty unilaterally as a gift to the empire, a gift that calls for obligation in return, right? Uh, and what he does when he does this is radicalize the idea of loyalty without setting it aside. But he does so without also uh, mentioning contract, right? Indeed, Gandhi is highly critical of the idea of contract. Uh, and when it comes to Khilafat, for instance, his vision of Hindu Muslim unity during the Khilafat movement um, relies upon abjuring the language of liberal contract. Um, by suggesting that it is contract that makes British rule possible uh, because it sets up the colonial state as a neutral third party uh, there to mediate between Hindus and Muslims conceived as interest groups, right? And therefore as identity groups in the way that I suggested at the beginning of this talk, uh, Islam had go gone on to become itself. Um, and by removing this idea of the third party, uh, you also get rid of these, the interested nature of these categories. You criticize the figure of interest um, and you end up with a set of relations between Hindus and Muslims, although of course other groups can be involved as well, uh, that are non-contractual, that are based on what Gandhi thought of as uh, ideals uh, and through a language of sacrifice, right? Um, and this way of thinking uh, both about the gift and about the refusal of contract uh, is something I've written about elsewhere. I won't go into it here, but it was a way of thinking that had great resonance uh, among um, uh, a number of Muslim intellectuals at the time. 
and I will mention only the famous poet, uh, often known as a satirical poet, Akbar Ilahabadi, who wrote in 1919, I think just before he dies, uh, uh, a kind of mock epic poem called the Gandhi Nama, in which he points specifically to this idea of Gandhi's, um, uh, that it is the ideal and sacrifice that makes for relation, intercommunal relations uh, and that makes them possible in a, in a fruitful, new, productive way and not contract which simply um, perpetuates their differences. Right? That it is only by removing contract that you can actually move forward. Now, the Khilafatis, um, what I've just suggested Gandhi was doing is he took the idea of loyalty, he took the idea of gift, um, and he turned them around in what I'm calling a gesture of radical loyalty. Uh, so he, he returns the gift, he creates an obligation on the part of the empire to its subjects. Um, and in doing so, he tries to redefine the relations between these subjects themselves. Right? So he has one set of relations between Indians and the British, um, which is the return of the gift, and another set of relations be among these subjects themselves, primarily Hindus and Muslims. Uh, and he removes the the notion of contract from that relationship. Now, the Khilafatists, the Muslim Khilafatists at the same time are doing what? Um, they too are dealing with what I'm calling uh, radical loyalty, right? They call upon Britain to uphold the religious freedom that uh, uh, the empire had allegedly promised them. Um, they, uh, 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 they eventually go on to, and I will describe this, uh, make a great deal of the, the idea of India as the greatest Mohammedan power and of the humanitarian imperative of empire. But what really interests me is how these, the, the sort of Khilafatis, and I'm talking about you know, all their major figures like the Ali brothers, Maulana Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali, uh, Dr. Ansari, Saifuddin Kichlu, et cetera. Uh, their point of reference uh, is not to the First World War at all, uh, nor indeed is it to the Ottoman Empire in any serious way. It is to the mutiny of 1857 and to the Queen's Proclamation of 1858 that follows it. So the mutiny um, was of course the, the final great um, act of resistance against the um, uh, establishment of uh, the British Empire in India. Uh, and upon its defeat, you have the Queen's Proclamation of 1858 that guarantees religious freedom um, to Hindus and Muslims. Uh, and it is this proclamation that the Khilafatists turn to over and over again, for instance, in the great trial for sedition of the Ali brothers and others uh, in 1921. The entire argument turns on uh, the proclamation. So this, of course, is one example of what I'm calling radical loyalty. They're using uh, imperial history itself and the categories of the colonial state itself against uh, the empire. Um, but what I find interesting is in doing so, they completely take leave of the war and its logic, right? Uh, nor is the Ottoman Empire in itself particularly important to, the, to this kind of argument. It is an argument about India and about Indian Muslims and the promises of the British colonial state to them. And it is premised upon the uh, betrayal of the Queen's proclamation and the betrayal of religious freedom in particular. Now, as they do this, uh, what they're doing, the Khilafatists, is to rethink this idea of India as the greatest Mohammedan power because their claims uh, on the, the, the claims uh, that Britain needs to um, preserve the sanctities of the holy cities uh, of Arabia and, and uh, uh, should refuse to uh, remove them from the control of the defeated Ottoman Empire are based A, upon their rights and privileges as Indian, British Indian subjects, and B, upon the 
fact that it is India uh, in, that has suddenly become, if you will, the center, if not the epicenter of this thing Jamil Aydin has discussed called the Muslim world, all right? Um, so the very idea of, uh, the very colonial idea of the greatest Mohammedan power and the humanitarian imperative that underlies it uh, is taken by the Khilafatists and taken abroad. So in very many interesting ways. So already in 1912, before the war begins, uh, we have the Indian medical mission to Turkey, right? So this uh, medical mission, which is funded by Indian Muslims is sent to uh, help the Turks during the Balkan war. Uh, and uh, it returns just before the First World War begins. Uh, while the medical mission is in Turkey, what it does is it sets up an Indo-Ottoman colonization society uh, that is meant to take the refugees, Muslim refugees who have come from the Balkans and resettle them in Anatolia in new towns that are to be given the names of Indian towns like Saharanpur, Faisabad, etc. Whose own uh, residents, those in India, will have contributed the funds for the setting up of these new colonies, right? So, what I, I mentioned this because uh, you see both the humanitarian imperative coming forth here, right? Um, uh, but also the idea of colonization taken from the imperial order and turned to rather different ends. And I think this idea and this humanitarian focus characterizes the Khilafat movement uh, from the very beginning, indeed from before it even begins in 1912 to the very end and even after. Uh, so let me give you another example. Um, in 1920, uh, you have one of the most significant events of the Khilafat movement, which is the Hijrat. Uh, the Hijrat, as you know, uh, I'm sure, uh, um, uh, has to do with the large scale migration of Muslims, mostly from the, the frontier uh, and Sindh and Baluchistan, and to some degree the Punjab, into Afghanistan, which was neutral during the war. Uh, and they leave India because they are being told or because they think that India has become a place unfit for Muslims. It is, has become, it is no longer Darul Islam because it no longer possesses religious freedom, which is the very thing, remember, that the Queen's proclamation promises to uphold. It is religious freedom that is crucial. It is not Darul Islam interpreted as the dominance of Muslim rule. Right? That is not the point. Um, so nearly 60,000 people, possibly 90,000, leave India and go to Afghanistan. And when they go to Afghanistan, what are they meant to do? Uh, again, really fascinating. Uh, when you look at the document, uh, I think in 1921, that is agreed between the Muhajirin on the one hand and the Afghan state on the other, uh, what the Afghan state expects uh, the Muhajirin to do is to provide it, i.e. Afghanistan, with uh, clerical uh, manpower, uh, with new ideas. With, basically, the Muhajirin are meant to both, depending who they are, to uh, create productive agriculture, uh, to teach in schools, to operate institutions, to modernize the Afghan state, right? Um, and to create agricultural and other colonies on the model of India with the canal colonies in the Punjab, for instance, right? Um, they are not necessarily meant to go to set up an Islamic dominion, nor are they meant to go onwards uh, to the Ottoman Empire. Maulana Obedullah Sindhi, who is in Kabul as a Gadarite uh, at the time, uh, is also stopping uh, Muslims who are coming through Afghanistan from going on to fight uh, in uh, the Ottoman lands because he too thinks that what they should be doing is strengthening the Afghan state and modernizing it as if the Afghan state uh, is meant to be a kind of model colony, a canal colony writ large for Muslim India, right? Um, and I would go so far as to argue then when you, that when you end up with the proposal for Pakistan eventually, 
it too can be seen as part of this logic, the logic of uh, the of colonization of of the, the colony as a site, as an experimental site uh, for remaking and reforming and modernizing a society. Right. So whether it is a how the colony as a housing colony, a type well well known through the subcontinent, or a canal colony, an agricultural colony, uh, or another kind of colony. Um, uh, you know, these uh, terms and the ideas that go along with them uh, can be seen in the activities of the Khilafat movement from 1912, I would argue, all the way to 1947 in some sense. Now, the humanitarian imperative behind colonization uh, is also signaled, uh, and even more importantly, in a way, in the rejection of race, tribe, ancestry, dynasty and nation as well as monarchy in the thought of the Khilafatists. Now, this is really extraordinary. Um, the, um, the, one of the ways in which the Khilafatists reclaim the idea of humanitarianism from the British Empire is not simply to suggest that the British have betrayed their end of the deal by, for instance, uh, refusing religious freedom to Muslims in the empire, but also to go on to argue that imperial humanitarianism is not truly humanitarian because it, it is based upon racial hierarchies and racial distinctions. The argument is then proposed that Islam does not make such distinctions and Islam therefore and uh, Muslims are uh, far more representative of imperial humanitarianism itself than the empire is. Uh, and so you have whether it is the Ali brothers or Maulana Azad or eventually Muhammad Iqbal, what you have is the emergence of an extraordinary array of arguments made in poetry and in prose and in speeches and in journalism about the non-racialism uh, of Islam and of Muslims, right? Uh, and this kind of argument is also deployed against the Arab claimants to the caliphate after it is abolished. As we know, uh, after the Khilafat movement, after the abolition of the Ottoman Empire, Indian Muslims are set largely, by and large, against any claims by Arab and other rulers uh, to the caliphate that are based on race, ancestry, or tribe. Uh, indeed, Maulan Azad goes so far as to reject the claim of Karshiyat. That is to say, uh, uh, the stipulation that the caliph has to be from the tribe of Quraysh, from the prophet's tribe. He rejects that as well. The Ottomans, of course, had not been a Quraysh either. Uh, so you have uh, what you have happening here is the reformulation, if you will, of colonial humanitarianism and its form of universe, demographic universality. Uh, on the one hand, thrown back into the teeth of the empire, on the other hand, used to justify, if you will, the, the, the remodeling and the modernization of Muslim societies uh, still on an imperial model. Uh, eventually, the Indian Muslim Khilafatis will also uh, be quite keen to replace the Ottoman dynasty by a parliament or even a caliph modeled upon uh, the Pope uh, in Rome. Right? So Maulvi Barkatullah, whom I mentioned just earlier, uh, eventually in 1924 writes a book called the Khilafat in which he suggests that the papacy is the model for the Khilafat, right? But it could be a parliament as well. In other words, their, uh, their fixation on the equality of the human race is such that it prompts the Khilafatis to uh, deny the absolute value given even to the Ottoman dynasty itself. Uh, they valorize the dynasty for purely pragmatic reasons. They have no theological or other investment in it. Uh, so it's neither Arabness, nor Karshiyat, nor dynasty, nor anything that is of concern to them and we know uh, I'm sure people in the audience will know that Muhammad Iqbal also during this period makes an argument uh, for the uh, Khilafat uh, to be constituted or reconstituted as a parliament. Right? Now, if the 
empire's humanitarianism, and I'm coming to the end here, uh, was based on its lack of geopolitical integrity. That of the Caliphate uh, also mirrored it uh, in interesting ways that I want to go on to describe. Uh, and this way of thinking about Islam in, in, if you will, topographical terms, goes back to the late 19th century. And I want to point in particular to a book called The Future of Islam. Uh, it's an interesting title because it's one of the earlier instances in which the term Islam is being used as a proper name in the way I described uh, beginning my talk. Right? The Future of Islam, the very phrase is a really novel phrase. You know, it could not have been possible to think about this idea before, the future of Islam. Uh, so. This book called The Future of Islam is written by an Islamophile called Wilfred Skaven Blunt, uh, an English Islamophile. And in it, uh, he argues that um, uh, the Muslim world, again, a new category, is at risk uh, of colonization by European powers. Uh, the Ottoman Empire is going to be destroyed. He's already arguing this in the 1880s. Uh, and the whole of North Africa is going to be taken over. Uh, uh, by France and Italy. Uh, the Caucasus and Central Asia are going to be taken over by the Russian Empire. He was true, he was right, it turns out. And therefore, the world of Islam needs to reconstitute itself in its eastern uh, end, as it were, um, and southern end in sub Saharan Africa and south and Southeast Asia. Uh, he then went on to think about a Muslim world protected by the Royal Navy, uh, with India, if you will, providing its demographic center, but with Arabia uh, being its notional, uh, uh, its notional center, right? a depoliticized de core that was guarded by the Royal Navy and which had no political uh, role to play. So he imagines a Muslim world uh, with, at its center, a core that has no politics. Very interesting. By the time you come to the Khilafat movement, you have a quite similar set of uh, geographical imaginaries emerging with people like Mawlana Azad. So he writes a famous book called uh, Maslai Khilafat or Jazurat al Arab, you know, the problem or the question of the Khilafat and the Arabian Peninsula or the Arabian island. And he argues that the Arabian island um, has to be reserved for Muslim uh, uh, rule, but should not itself be the site of political power. Right? Uh, now, how does he make this argument? It's an interesting argument. And you understand he has to make it because he's supporting the Ottomans. Right? So the political power lies in Istanbul, uh, but the, as it were, uh, uh, geographical center lies in Mecca, right? So he's, he's conceived of the Muslim world in a kind of bifurcated way, in a dual way. And he has a, uh, the vocabulary he uses is fascinating. He talks about a markaz arzi that's the geographical center, which is Arabia, and a markaz e ijtemai a social, if you will, center, which is, um, in this case, Constantinople, but it could be anywhere. Right? So what is permanent is the markaz -e arzi the geographical or earthly center of Islam. Uh, but it is not meant to be the same as its political center because what Azad wants to do is to protect uh, the world of Islam uh, in its own right and not twin it with uh, a political uh, project, though it requires a political project as well. So there are two markazes, and each one has a daira, right? So you have a center, a markaz, and each one has a daira, a circumference or a circle that it forms around it. And these two things, these two circles overlap, but they are not the same. Now, this is an interesting vocabulary because what it does is it reimagines the world um, in, in terms that are barely geographical and that, that are certainly not geopolitical. Right? Uh, they are cosmological in some senses because when Azad describes what he means, he says that 
you know, uh, he says that all parts of human life uh, or natural life are made up of such markazes and dairas, right? So that the animal life has as its markaz the heart and the daira is the body. Plant life has as its markaz the roots and then the leaves and shoots, etc. its uh, body. Uh, similarly, geography and all the rest, right? The, the solar system has the sun as its markaz and the planets as its daira, right? So he makes a cosmological argument which he then reads into geography in a way that, uh, in a way that makes it quite difficult to understand it in purely cartographic terms, right? Um, and what he does uh, is say that um, uh, these two circles uh, are co-present and overlap, uh, but one must be protected from the other, that you cannot confuse the political and the, if you will, geographic here. So he's making a separation uh, and doing so by re reimagining, if you will, world geography in almost geometrical terms, right? Markazes and dairas are cosmological, but they're also geometric in conception. Now, the reason I mentioned this uh, coming to my end very soon is to say, is, is, is to ask us to reflect a bit upon how such a, what appears to be strange vision um, comes to manifest itself in actual sites uh, and monuments. Right? So now one of the great objectives of the Khilafat movement was to protect the shrines in Arabia uh, and in uh, what is today Iraq, right? Which shrines are we talking about? Obviously Mecca and Medina, but also Najaf and Karbala and Kazimain and indeed Baghdad, right? So they are a mixture of sites and shrines, both Sunni and Shia. Um, the argument is rarely geographically described. It is described in terms of these sacred sites. Um, but, and so one of the earliest Khilafat organizations, for instance, is called the Anjuman e Khudam e Kaaba, right? The, the society of the servants of the Kaaba, because the Kaaba has to be protected. It must remain under Muslim rule, etc. cetera. Um, what Azad's conception does is to deprive these sites, these sacred sites of their ritual valence or value. They become simply as it were points, geometrical points. So when for instance in 1924, the Wahhabis take over many of these shrine cities uh, and destroy shrines not least in Mecca and Medina themselves, he's left unmoved. There are a lot of people who are against it, but for Azad, what's important about these sites is not the shrines that they possess and the rituals that occur at those shrines. What is important about them and about Mecca in particular is that it is simply a geometrical point, which he calls, which he suggests is this, uh, the symbol of human, unity, right? That what Mecca, what Mecca represents is Islam as a way of thinking about human relations that has no racial hierarchy or tribal distinction involved. That's it. It is a historical site uh, that represents a reality which is in a, in a purely geometrical way. And so he deprecates the destruction of shrines, but he argues that, well, you know, there is justification for it in scripture, and therefore he's not particularly upset that they are being destroyed. I point this out in order to show how it is that this language uh, of um, humanity uh, and of expansiveness and scope uh, takes traditional terms and structures and remakes them uh, in, into symbols and geometrical points um, in the name 
of humanity and equality. Uh, now, Iqbal, I will end with him. Uh, he had very little interest in the caliphate. He was not particularly wedded to it, though he writes poetry during the Khilafat movement, which is pro-Ottoman. But all of his poems are in fact about humanitarianism. All right, they're all about instances in wars. And he starts writing these poems even during the Balkan and the Tripolitan Wars before the First World War, uh, in which uh, the Ottomans uh, refused to distinguish between Muslims and Christians, uh, in which they, these battles in which Christian prisoners of war are treated well or given water, women are not killed, etc. So, you know, the, the Iqbal's way of thinking about what comes to be known as the Khilafat movement is in a different way from Azad, but otherwise quite similar, uh, entirely humanitarian uh, in, its, uh, in its nature, in its character. Um, and this offers yet another example. I've just given you the one from Azad where his focus on the shrine cities of Arabia uh, is actually not a focus on the shrines or the rituals. It's a focus simply on geometrical points and on symbols and representations. Iqbal's focus similarly is not actually on the caliphate. Uh, he doesn't have any real concern with it. Uh, it is on the humanitarianism of Muslims, right? Which he glorifies. Uh, he ends up of course being the most sophisticated thinker uh, of Islam considered as a humanitarian enterprise, an enterprise and a category taken from colonial self-representation and from the legitimization and justification of colonial rule in humanitarian terms. Right? Uh, and in doing so, of course, he accomplishes, I think, nothing more and nothing less than the secularization of Islam. And we know um, that um, eventually Iqbal will come up with this argument of Islam representing the emergence of humanity itself as a historical actor in its own right. How does this happen? It happens due to the idea of the finality of prophethood, right? Precisely because the prophet announces himself as the last one, in Iqbal's view, he opens up the future which is to say post-prophetic history as a site for human freedom and human freedom without differentiation. So without races and tribes and all the rest, right? Um, he has a similar way in which he thinks about um, uh, uh, the same question, both from, if you will, a Sunni angle and a Shia angle, the Sunni angle I've just mentioned, the Shia angle has to do with the uh, occultation, the greater occultation of the 12th Imam and Iqbal argues that once that happens, uh, that space of time which exists uh, uh, between the vanishing of the Imam and his return is the site for human freedom again, all right? So from either side, this is what Islam has become. Uh, Islam signals and represents the idealization and the representation of the human race the humanity comes to be an actor in its own right, uh, but only with the disappearance of the sacred, only with the disappearance of the prophet on the one hand and the imam on the other. And I wanted to end there by uh, contrasting what Iqbal says in the 1930s eventually to what I just described of Azad, uh, where this great geometrically defined space uh, of Islam and the Muslim world uh, uh, is defined by sites like Mecca and like Constantinople uh, for which uh, rituals and beliefs and practices are no longer of any great concern. Um, and so in the end, what happens to Khilafat or what happens of Khilafat uh, is that it, 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 it flows into what I have called the secularization of Islam. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I think that's, um, you know, we couldn't have asked for a better start for the series because I think you've, you know, right, 
got right to the heart of the matter. Um, uh, and particularly, I, I think in this, this notion of the, the emergence of this very category of Islam um, is central to the desacralization and the secularization of it as a concept and even you could say as a reality. Um, I just want to um, sort of comment on one point uh, just to bring together what I thought were the three key uh, features of this um, colonial making of, of Islam, uh, sort of taking it from the colonial practice and then how I think quite rightly you've said this has almost become the way in which the post-colonial um, Muslim space in South Asia has emerged. Uh, and we see this, I mean, there's so many obvious examples of how things work in Pakistan in particular. Um, and, and then I'm gonna ask uh, one particular question, which will take us back to that uh, period in the Khilafat. So the, the three themes were just to kind of reiterate what you said, um, which are the features of this, is the first one is this notion of the humanitarian intervention. Right, so defining um, agency in these terms uh, and, and seeing uh, the subject uh, in a universal sense. Uh, it's interesting that that kind of humanitarian intervention is always intervening in others. It's not intervening in the self, so to speak. Uh, and that I think you can see that again in so many other examples uh, in later history. The second one is this notion of the, uni the unilateralism and the, the absence of contractual constitutionalism even. Um, and I think, again, that's a, a very interesting way of looking at how it is that even uh, modern Islamic so-called political thought develops um, in its most extreme form. I would refer to something like, you know, Vilay de Fari um, in Iran, which is in a sense, it's kind of most uh, sort of the ultimate logical um, end of that. And the third one is the way in which territory is rethought. So, you know, the point you made about how territory is divested of power, of contiguity, and even of sacrality um, is something that we can see in so many ways uh, across the, this new category, as you said, of, of the Muslim um, world, which, which comes out of the colonial context. So, uh, you know, that's just my kind of rather crude uh, summary of what you were saying, but I think those three points are so um, central to, I think, the sorts of conversations we're trying to open up on Islam and, and colonialism. I guess the, the, the question I would ask, which is maybe for you to think about how you apply that, is it seems to me that one of the um, exemplary ways in which this sort of British colonial practice of Islam um, is sort of defined is through um, the imperial um, control of the Hajj, um, and, and then how those practices of the, the control of the Hajj um, have in effect um, become the blueprint for how the Saudi state deals with the Hajj later. So perhaps if you could comment a bit more on, on, on the imperial Hajj and, and how that kind of exemplifies these themes that you're, you're bringing up. Thanks, uh, Sajad. I mean, you put it much better than I did, I have to say, because I was, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, the Hajj, I mean, this is, of course, John Slight has, a, as you know, a book on this subject, a very interesting book. Um, and um, towards the end of which he, he uh, rather too briefly says how it was that in 1956, um, the Suez crisis, when Britain was unable to perform so Britain ran the global Hajj until 1956. Um, so well after India and Pakistan's independence, but in 1956 with the Suez crisis when Britain, France and Israel invaded Egypt, Britain was no longer capable of running the Hajj. And so she handed over this duty to Pakistan, uh, which ran it for a bit until the Saudis then took over properly uh, once they were able to do so. So the chain of inheritances there is absolutely fascinating. You know, it goes from Britain to Pakistan and then to Saudi Arabia, right? Um, and of course, in running the Hajj, uh, and Britain could run the Hajj because, precisely because it was the world's greatest Mohammedan power, right? It had more Muslims uh, in its territories than the Sultan had, the Ottoman Sultan had in his. 
And once the Ottoman Empire was uh, demolished, then of course Britain stood unrivaled. Um, and as John Slyke describes it, you have people who need, whose ar the arrangements for whose pilgrimage has to be made from Malaysia on the one hand, right? Uh, British dominion and Nigeria on the other, right? And everything in between. Uh, so uh, to say nothing of South Asia. Uh, so this was one way in which the idea of a Muslim world was created through the movement of pilgrims back and forth, institutionalized by colonial rule, which kept Arabia as a depoliticized center. Right? Uh, it's exactly what is, it, as it were, Blunt and uh, uh, eventually Maulana Azad were saying right, that you, and that's what I find fascinating about it, that the idea of the Hajj uh, from the 19th century gets to be one in which the movements of pilgrims limb this idea of a Muslim world uh, and they're increasingly bureaucratized in very modern ways, uh, you know, passports, permits, uh, um, quarantine, testing, etc. cetera, uh, while, keeping the core of the Muslim world uh, a place which has, as a place which has no politics. Now, today, of course, you have the attempt by the Saudi state to actually assert itself as a political center of Islam, as much as it's, as it were, uh, markaz -e arzi right? Um, whether that will happen or not, I myself doubt it. Uh, uh, what is crucial is that for the first time, really, you see an interruption of that old logic of the center without politics. Uh, the politics must have its own center, but it is elsewhere. Um, and so I think that is what is new about it, but everything else remains in place, uh, remains the same. I mean, in fact, I, I would say it, it is very much the same because um, as we all know, uh, during the Hajj, there is no space for politics, right? So there's a very explicit denial of politics during the Hajj. Uh, but also above and beyond that, I mean, the desacralization is, is so obvious to anyone who's even sees pictures of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, this sense of, um, uh, you know, making a ritual into, you know, what you would call a tamasha, basically. I mean, it's a tamasha, you've got people circumambulating you know, speaking on their mobile phones, taking pictures and stuff, you know, selfies, and, and there's no sense of the sacred. Um, uh, so in many ways, I think the Saudis have really taken that, that process much further um, than, than the British may perhaps had even intended. Yes, I fully agree, having been there myself, um, uh, and I was, even I was astounded by all these things that you describe. Uh, and it's true, at the very heart of Islam, in the Haram, what do you find? Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's, selfies, uh, et cetera. So the depoliticized heart has become the heart of capital, among other things. Uh, uh, yes. It's about, it's about this I, religious identity of you know, the, the consumer, really. The Muslim as, as consumer, uh, yeah. Um, Thank you. Right. Uh, consumerism, of course, is also an internationalist uh, identity. Um, but what I wanted to ask uh, uh, about, uh, thank you for that very, very rich and suggestive, as always, uh, talk, uh, Faisal. I wanted to ask you, given that it is about, uh, you know, uh, forms of internationalism and joining other such recent explorations of uh, uh, all kinds of different forms of internationalism, uh, Marxist internationalisms, uh, decolonial internationalisms, uh, but also first world internationalisms in terms of the uh, internationalism of white supremacy, uh, which was, there have been a number of books about uh, in this uh, time period, which was very organized internationally also uh, at the time. So yes, inter uh, Khilafat movement is very much part of that internationalist, uh, uh, internationalist side of politics uh, at this historical moment. Um, uh, and as you pointed out, there was a, a considerable over, overlap. I mean, I remember in that Ansari's book, Emergence of Socialist Thought Amongst Indian Muslims, 
it begins with Ubaidullah Sindhi being in the, the Soviet Union. Uh, so there was also that, uh, 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 that remarkable uh, sort of intersection between uh, somebody like Ubaidullah Sindhi, you know, re, uh, what we usually call religious, religious internationalism as, and Marxist internationalism uh, as well in this historical moment. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about these, uh, some of these uh, uh, very different kinds of concerns and the conflicts between these internationalisms, because Wahhabism is also a kind of internationalism, uh, uh, a kind of universalism. Um, uh, which Maulana's here, uh, you've talked about Assad, uh, 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 sorry, about Azad, but uh, somebody like uh, Hassan Deobandi or uh, Maulana Bari, I mean, one of the ways and uh, one of the reasons that he broke up with uh, Maulana Muhammad Ali Johar, they had this falling out, uh, was precisely over this question of uh, between what became Saudi Arabia and uh, the Ottoman and so again, a, a kind of conflict between uh, uh, that we have at this moment. Um, but, and also, uh, you know, as you were pointing out, this, uh, this kind of uh, humanitarian internationalism, as you're calling, uh, calling it, Muslim humanitarian internationalism. Uh, I was thinking of Shabir Omani writing in uh, precisely at the time, uh, same decade as Blunt, this uh, Heroes of Islam. And the first book he writes, of course, is Al Farooq. Uh, and the reason for that is because he's, port he's portraying Omar precisely as a humanitarian internationalist uh, caliph. Yeah. Um, now I wanted to ask you about the, in uh, you know, about our inheritance of this, because uh, of course, uh, when you're looking back at this, uh, you can only. Uh, look back ruefully or uh, at best yeah because the uh, uh, the uh, the current forms uh, in which this inheritance this modern inheritance and that we should be very clear about uh, and i think that's what you're talking about is the modernity of these internationals first of all uh, it's also related to the national imperialism that we are talking about because of course the colonial state was national imperialist so what we're talking about over here uh, is this new a Muslim as a nation, a Muslim nationalist uh, uh, imperialism, because the, the old imperialisms weren't national. Uh, the inheritance of this is really, really uh, quite uh, terrible. Uh, uh, the articulations of it in Pakistan, and you know, it's not just uh, it's not just Saudi Arabia who has these uh, uh, aspirations of becoming, you know, these uh, the center of. The empire of Islam, but you know Turkey once again returning to that uh, in a in a more nationalist form, returning to that Ottoman past, um, but uh, also Pakistan. I mean, funny as it is, uh, it's a very very important part of Pakistani national identity. This uh, well, I don't know how humanitarian it is, but it's, uh, the humanitarian side of that humanitarian internationalism is pretty much uh, gone. Uh, so. That, that, those are my thoughts and my question to you. Yeah, I know you're right. And, you know, Abdul Bari of Molana, Abdul Bari, of course, is, as you say, is famously breaks with the Khilafatists because he cannot tolerate the treatment of these shrines in this, in the, the kind of, you know, way that Molana Azad is willing to do. Uh, and um, he really is interested in rituals and in sacrality and all of these things. Uh, for him, they are not just symbols and representations of humanity. Um, and the story of Mawlana Abdul Bari is very interesting because you know, he's at the forefront of the first Khilafatist organization, as I said, the Anjuman al Qudam al Kaaba. And you see what happens to the Kaaba and to other shrines from the time he begins, by the time you get to Azad and later, uh, a complete sea change. Uh, so that you know, it's a, it, it would be interesting to tell the story of Khilafat through people like him, uh, you know, at, at what point they sort of peel off from the project uh, and what they're interested in and why is it that they lose out uh, and not the others. Uh, the, the thing about Marxism, of course, you're right. And this is, you know, Ubaidullah Sindhi says this in his, uh, in the various things he wrote, you know, Kabul Me Saat Sal and you know, these uh, documents that he writes, that he's really interested in funneling people 
not to the uh, you know Middle Eastern battlefields, uh, not to the Ottoman or ex-Ottoman domains, but in Afghanistan and Central Asia, and then towards the Soviet Union, which of course is uh, uh, founded in the middle of the war, in the middle of the First World War. Uh, so uh, that gets to be the new, as it were, route. Um, and as we know, Iqbal is also much concerned with the Soviet Union uh, and with communism um, as what he thinks is the only conceptual or philosophical or intellectual rival to Islam, right? Because they are seeing communism as also making a claim to the egalitarian uh, and universalistic uh, and anti-racial uh, unity of mankind. Uh, and the only thing that sticks in their craw is of course class war, which none of them like. Um, uh, so uh, the Soviet Union and communism get to be very quickly the new rival, but also the model for Islamic internationalism. And that lasts for quite a while. Uh, so, you know, they might start up with imperial ideas of humanitarianism and of its geographical scope. Uh, but by the end of the war, the you know, Marxism becomes a really uh, much stronger and more viable way of thinking about these issues. Uh, though you also have the League of Nations and post-imperial in, in this, at least in the European sense, um, internationalism. Uh, so all of these things are in play and, and some of these projects continue on. You know? So after the war, there are you know, attempts to get uh, Germany, East Africa given to India for her colonization as a sub-imperial power improvement. You know? Um, and, uh, you know, there are many, there are other such projects, some of which, as I said, continue. And I, I would, as, as I suggested, Pakistan itself might be seen in that genealogy among, it's not, that is not the only genealogy it is part of, but I think it is certainly one of them, along with these colonies in Afghanistan and all the rest. And in, in, in all of them, of course, the, um, the, uh, as I was saying earlier, in response to Sajjad, the, um, the way in which, as you suggest, you know, Pakistan offers itself as a new defender of Islam. All of these ideas rely upon the emptiness at the very heart of the geographical, supposedly geographical center of Islam, which is to say Arabia. Uh, the only reason why Pakistan then or Turkey today can make these claims is because Arabia has to be seen as being sort of emptied out of everything, uh, but, uh, and it can only exist as a, as a historical site of the making of humanity or something. But you know, this goes back earlier. So I, it just occurred to me that when you look at um, a novel like, um, uh, by Nazir Ahmed, it's a famous, uh, Mirat al Rus, I think, um, which is about the education of girls, of Muslim girls. Right? Uh, and in it, he describes a geography lesson and there are two girl students who are learning geography. It's fascinating. So they, they are looking at a map, which you assume is a modern map, right? A British type map, but they are reading it quite differently. So they are saying, ah, Iran, Turan, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Turan cannot have a place on a map of the late 19th century because it doesn't exist as a political um, entity, right? Arab, you know, et cetera. Uh, so on the one hand, there's that. There's an interesting layering. There is a kind of modern cartographic um, representation on the one hand, and then there's a kind of almost mnemonic uh, reading off from it. Uh, what then happens is that each of these places is given a kind of character. And Arabia is seen as being empty of everything, but uh, it represents only the site of revelation, of Islam's revelation, right? It has nothing there. And the whole point is that there's nothing there. It's just deserts, 
uh, apparently they're no human beings or they are of no consequence. Um, uh, nothing grows there according to the, the figure, the character who's showing the map to these young girls in that novel. And it is the site of divine revelation. So for Nazir Ahmed, this has not yet become the symbol of Islam as a humanitarian imperative or you know, of the Muslim community as the first representative of the human race as Iqbal will have it. But it has already been emptied out of any political or other content. Uh, so I find that quite fascinating. And I think it's that longer history that allows for these claims uh, precisely because uh, the center must be empty. Um, I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, we're, we're happy to take, I, I believe uh, Faisal is definitely happy to take questions. Uh, so if you do want to ask a question, if you put it in the comments section um, on the Facebook pages, then we can take them. Um, at the moment, I think we only have one question, um, which I think was kind of touched on before. Um, it's very specific. Um, why, why did uh, Jinnah refuse to participate in the Khilafat movement? Well, he, he didn't refuse. Um, uh, well, he refused to participate in the Khilafat movement as a Congress enterprise led by Gandhi. Uh, but he was quite active in the early um, uh, sort of debates, uh, letter writing and this sort of thing. Um, And he, as he always acted as a lawyer, right? So he represented his clients, if you will, the Muslim community, um, uh, and he represented their interests. Um, and that's how he dealt with the Khilaf movement. Otherwise, he was not particularly interested. Uh, and indeed, like Iqbal, he ends up being a great fan of the man who destroyed the caliphate, Mustafa Kamal Pasha. Uh, so for men like Iqbal and Jinnah, the Khilafat was, whatever it was, it had no particular theological resonance. Um, uh, and you could move very easily from the Ottomans to the Young Turks uh, and, and the Ataturk, and not simply the Ataturk as a Ghazi who defended the empire in its last days, but the man who abolished the Caliphate. Right? Uh, and as we know, Jinnah modeled himself on the Ataturk. Uh, we, know, we, we don't know that much about his reading habits, but we do know that he, he, he was fascinated by a biography of the Ataturk called Grey Wolf. And he recommended it to his daughter uh, among others. So that's another part of the story that is really quite fascinating. And I think that fits into what I was saying about the desacralization affected by the Khilafah movement. Because why should it be so easy to move between an ostensibly theological or religious cause like the Khilafat to the Ataturk and Turkish Republicanism uh, with its uh, explicit uh, secular credentials right, and claims? Uh, it was, it, there seemed to be no problem at all. Iqbal could do it and Jinnah could do it. Uh, so on this uh, subject, they were not very different from each other, though, of course, Iqbal had other criticisms of the Kemalist uh, enterprise. Uh, if one is uncharitable, one could say, well, maybe what they are really interested in is, if you will, in, in, in Muslim power, the consolidation of power, and, of course, what goes along with it, the modernization of Islam. Uh, now that modernization can take many forms and what I tried to point out in my somewhat disjointed talk was how, you know, Afghanistan got to be one form that this idea of modernization or colonization, as I call it, took with Hijrat, right? Um, and then there was the Indian medical mission and there were many other such, uh, other such things, uh, very few of which I actually looked at um, in any studies of the Khilafat. I think what we'll do is let's just take one last question. And this is quite interesting. Um, question is, what is the role of 
knowledge, evoking it as an agency in this imagination of humanitarian Islam. Yes, um, yes, that is interesting. Um, I mean, of course, for uh, someone like Gandhi, um, that moral courage was absolutely crucial, but it was uh, therefore also sacrificial. Um, you know, it was not about conquest and winning. Uh, it was about offering, um, if you will, the gift of sacrifice. Um, and you know, when I mentioned in my talk, uh, the Gandhi Nama of Akbar al Habadi, when he's writing about uh, Gandhi, he says that of all people, it is Gandhi who has understood what Islam is about uh, because he has privileged and he gives you one term. This term is what Islamic struggle is. And that term is sabr, fortitude, uh, right? Sabr is indeed a classical Islamic term. Um, and I find it, fascinating that of all these figures, it is Akbar al Abadi practically alone who foregrounds that term, fortitude, which requires courage, but which is not about conquest. It's about an offering and an endurance, uh, which has value in its own right. Uh, otherwise you have, uh, you know, the sort of standard issue humanitarian arguments. Sabr is not a part of a humanitarian argument. Uh, it has its own history and its own genealogy. And I'm not saying that it's used in a traditional fashion, uh, but in my view, it doesn't fit with that, uh, the humanitarian argument that the Khilafatists are otherwise making, um, which is why Gandhi is interesting because there's a story to be written about how Gandhi ends up influencing uh, many of his Muslim interlocutors um, in different ways. You know, Maududi, I have argued elsewhere, is influenced by Gandhi um, and non cooperation in particular. The Jamaat Islami's refusal to do various things, for instance, participate in democratic elections for a long time. Right? It's withholding. Um, he influences Maulana Azad, of course, his close ally. Uh, uh, in part, as others have argued, because Azad is very keen on becoming a kind of Mahatma-like figure for Muslims. Um, uh, but there are other forms of influence as well. Um, but the way in which the historiography goes, uh, you know, it's, it tends to be communally divided. So it's, there can be no influence uh, from a Hindu to a Muslim or a Muslim to a Hindu. Um, whereas in fact, you see it happening uh, all the time. And I would, I would, I guess, end with, um, with uh, Gandhi because uh, by stressing endurance, sabr and sacrifice uh, and trying to exit the humanitarian language in this manner, um, what Akbar Labadi realizes is that uh, at issue isn't precisely not Islam as an identity, as a modern identity. At issue is something else. Um, which can only be given these names like sacrifice, like endurance, um, that are not part of the humanitarian canon. And therefore it is interesting to realize how Gandhi himself is really distrustful of the idea of humanity. He doesn't like it very much. He understands uh, where it comes from uh, and where it's going to. Uh, and so even as early as in Swaraj in 1909, he castigates this idea. Uh, so perhaps that is one place from which we can begin when thinking about uh, Islam after colonialism. Uh, thank you very much, Faisal. Um, as I said, I think that's a really good beginning to the series. Um, thank you for your time. It's coming up 6.30 in London and I think 10.30 in Karachi. Um, so um, I think uh, I should just quickly mention our next um, one of these seminars is actually next week. It's a bit earlier than, than we would expect it. Um, it will be um, Shankar Nair from the University of Virginia, and he'll be talking, he'll be taking it slightly earlier and talking about Muslim um, Hindu encounters in the Mughal period.
uh, and that very much foregrounds in many ways the ways in which we actually nowadays look at this category of Islam and colonialism and the way in which contemporary South Asia in particular looks back at this contestation of, of the Mughal period. So please uh, join us at the same time uh, next week for, for Chanka. And um, uh, I think that's that's all I have to say. Um, I don't know if Norman, if you have anything to add. Um, but yeah, just to say thank you once again to Faisal um, for joining us and everyone else who's been watching it. And uh, we will have, the recording of this will remain on the Facebook page and it will also go on the Exeter IAIS um, YouTube channel. Um, so if you haven't been able to watch all of it, you can always catch up later. So um, thank you once again and uh, bye. See you next week. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Cheers.